So this is the second lecture of unit four and today we'll be talking about reluctance motor. And this lecture will be moving a bit fast. So if you are taking notes from this video, you can pause it or rewind it for doing so. And I suggest you to take notes from this lecture because instead of writing much in these slides, I have preferred explaining most of them. So most of the things I will be explaining will not be written on the slides. Well, compared to other types of synchronous motors, reluctance motor is a salient type which means that it will be having projecting poles, unlike non-salient or cylindrical type where rotor is a bit smoother. This saliency in rotor allows to have a variable reluctance in the air gap as the rotor rotates. Moreover, this type of motor does not have any field excitation on rotor. In fact, rotor is made of ferromagnetic material, for example, iron. Then over here are figures of the two types of rotor. This one has four projecting poles and is a salient type while second figure is a cylindrical type since it does not have any projecting pole. These are the schematic of the two types of motor. So simply by looking into the rotor of these schematics one can easily sort out the salient type and non-salient type or cylindrical type of the rotor. Note that these figures only explain salient and cylindrical rotor. They are not rotors of reluctance motor. The saliency in rotor is introduced in order to have large difference in reluctances in the air gap when rotor teeth are in front of the stator pole to that when rotor is oriented such that there are no rotor teeth in front of the stator pole. That is, rotor tries to align itself in minimum reluctance position. Shown over here are the two types of rotor of reluctance motor. The type of rotor design in figure 2 allows minimum reluctance, that is, it allows magnetic flux lines to pass through most easily. Reluctance motor are of three types, synchronous reluctance, variable reluctance and switch reluctance, abbreviated as SYRM, VRM and SRM respectively. Each of these have different operation and applications. While synchronous reluctance motor has salient rotor and a smooth stator similar to induction motor, variable reluctance motor and switch reluctance motor both have salient pole, rotor and stator. In synchronous reluctance motor, input given is AC and they are available at high power ratings. Variable reluctance motor have low power rating and it operates in open loop that is there are no feedback involved in its operation. In switch reluctance motor, the stator coils are digitally committed. Their operation is controlled by employing a closed loop feedback system. The figure below shows the types of rotor each of these different motors employ. To understand the principle of working of this motor, let us first understand the property being employed. Shown over here are two figures, each one having core made of low reluctance material with one completely closed while the other has an air gap. Which do you think has larger reluctance? Of course the one shown in figure B has larger reluctance because of the air gap since air has larger reluctance compared to the core material. This is an elementary reluctance motor comprising of a stator core with winding of n turns to produce magnetic field. While this small bar is the rotor which is free to rotate above the center. Here we define two axes. One is stator axis or D axis, also called as direct axis, which goes along the direction of magnetic field when the stator is energized. The other is the interpole or Q axis or quadrature axis which is perpendicular to the d-axis. Now suppose that we place a small piece of bar having low reluctance in the air gap at different orientations as shown in figure 1 and 2. Now which part do you think has larger reluctance? It's the one shown in figure 1. Since the path for flux which has to complete its path through air gap is more in figure 1 than in figure 2. This is because the distance the magnetic flux lines has to cover in the air gap is more when the rotor ma makes certain angle with the d-axis shown by L1 as compared to the distance L2 when the rotor is along the d-axis. That is L1 is greater than L2. Thus the reluctance offered to the establishment of magnetic flux will be more in figure 1 than in figure 2.
If suppose that I energize the core in figure 2, the flux lines establish along the core while going straight through the rotor bar. On the other hand, on energizing core of figure 1, the flux lines tend to follow the low reluctance path through the tilted rotor. Since the rotor is tilted, the air gap between rotor and poles of core here is more as compared to the air gap in figure 2. It can be proved by the concept learned in first year. If the air gap is made large, then more energy is stored in the air gap. This means that making system have a larger air gap will store more energy in the gap. By the second law of thermodynamics, the system will try to achieve low energy states. And thus if the rotor is offset from its stable position, that is figure 2, it will return back to that position. Now we look for the torque speed characteristics. The shown characteristic correspond to the SYRM, that is synchronous reluctance motor, employing a split phase, which is a single phase. Since synchronous reluctance motor is the only type that before reaching synchronous speed first operates at a speed less than the synchronous speed, while the other two types, variable reluctance and switch reluctance motor operate at synchronous speed right from start. So there will be no question for torque speed characteristics of the two. As is clear from the figure, the characteristic is quite nonlinear. The starting torque of this motor greatly depends on position or rather orientation of the rotor which means that this point is not fixed, rather varies depending upon the angle the rotor makes with the stator pole. Further as the speed of the motor increases, this trend is followed till it reaches a speed enough to operate the centrifugal switch, which isolates the auxiliary winding. So you have already studied about split phase induction motor in first year and how centrifugal switch works. So it operates around 70 to 80 percent of rated speed. When the auxiliary winding is isolated from the motor, this characteristic is obtained. Here you can see crest, which is the maximum torque this motor can achieve. But note that this point is not at the synchronous speed. Nevertheless, if you look at the torque axis, this point corresponds to about six times the value of rated torque. Now when the rotor closes the synchronous speed, the reluctance torque establishes, which locks the rotor to the rotating stator field. So this is the point where motor operates at synchronous speed. Now if you look at this operating point, which is the stable point of operation, here the load torque can range from 0 to about 2 times its rated value. But as soon as you increase the load beyond this, the motor will pull out from synchronism and will operate at a speed less than this synchronous speed where it will work as induction motor. So the motor will be operating in this region. Moreover, if the load torque increases beyond the crest of this curve, so we are talking about torque beyond this point, the motor will stop or stall. So reluctance torque will allow the rotor to cling to the nearest stator pole. Now we will look for the reluctance torque acting on the rotor. So this will be applicable to all the three types of reluctance motors, namely synchronous, variable and switched. We assume the excitation current as I sine omega ST, where omega S corresponds to the frequency of sinusoidal variation of current supply. Moreover, if the load torque increases beyond the crest of the curve, so we are talking about the torque Since we are talking about synchronous speed, which means the angle of rotor that it makes with the stator pole is omega st minus delta. Here delta is the lag angle between rotor and stator field. The developed torque can be expressed as del by del theta of wf, where wf is called as co-energy. For the time being, assume it as energy. We took partial derivative of wf because it also depends on the current. We also learned in previous year, just like resistance offers opposition to establishment of electric current, reluctance offers opposition to establishment of magnetic flux. Thus an element that offers reluctance to magnetic flux can be said to have inductance though they have an inverse relation. Thus we represent here air gap reluctance which varies sinusoidally in the form of inductance as 
L of theta, which varies as a function of theta. This variation can simply be drawn as this figure, where LD and LQ are the D axis and Q axis in the tens respectively, uh, which means if the rotor is aligning along the D axis, inductance is maximum. While if the rotor is aligning perpendicular to the D axis, that is along Q axis, inductance will be minimum, which is also in confirmation that along D axis, the system will have minimum reluctance and along Q axis, it will be maximum. So now we write co-energy in the magnetic field of air gap as WF dash which is equal to half Li square. So since L is a function of theta, so we have written here half L, L of a function of theta I square. And thus the torque that is developed can be written as del by del theta of Wf dash, which comes out to be equal to half of I square del by del theta of L theta. And from equation A, so in the previous slide, if you look, equation A, which is L theta function of theta, which was given as L naught plus L2 cos 2 theta. If you put this value in the, in the expression of TD, you get uh, torque, TD, uh, developed torque equal to uh, minus I square L2 sine 2 theta sine square omega ST. So you get this expression by putting equation A in the previous equation and then solving it. Now from this, the average torque is given as, okay, one thing in the previous equation is that we are now writing capital I, which means uh, the RMS value. So from this average torque is given as equal to minus I square L2 divided by four sine of two delta. More from the variation curve of inductance from previous slide, let's see. We observed that L2 is equal to LD minus LQ divided by 2. So this can easily be taken out from uh, the expression from, from the curve of L theta. So you see this gap as L2. So the difference between L0 and LD is L2. And again, the difference between L0 and LQ is L2. So we get L2 equal to LD minus LQ by 2. And thus the developed torque the average developed torque reduces to minus I square multiplied by LD minus LQ divided by 8 into sine 2 delta. So show you what here is the waveform of average developed torque versus delta. Delta is the lag angle between the rotor and the stator fields. So here you will see two types of operation. One is the motor operation shown on the left side and the generator operation shown on the right side. So since we have can find ourselves talking about motors in this unit and generator is not in our unit uh, is not in the syllabus so we'll be talking about the motoring operation if you look at this curve you'll see that the torque uh, the maximum torque appears at minus pi by 4 which is equal to i square ld minus lq divided by 8 which can be obtained easily by putting the value of theta uh, the value of delta in equation B in the previous slide. So this expression reduces to minus I square LD minus LQ divided by 8. Sorry, plus, plus, I square, plus I square LD minus LQ divided by 8. Now further increasing the value of delta to minus 90 degree reduces the torque to 0. This is the place and the angle the value of delta at zero and minus 90 degree corresponds to the orientation of rotor along the uh, stator poles. Thus we come to the conclusion that reluctance torque is proportional to minus sine of two delta, which was seen in equation B. And the maximum torque called the pull out torque occurs at delta equal to minus 45 degrees on increasing the load torque will cause the rotor to operate at larger negative delta. The reluctance motor starts as an induction motor but runs as synchronous motor. 
So we have a note down there. The motor starts as induction as long as squirrel cage bars and end rings are present in the rotor. So we are talking about synchronous reluctance motor. Now here is a home assignment question that you have to do. A reluctance motor with two poles has direct axis inductance as 0 0.8 Henry. So this is LD and quadrature axis inductance LQ as 0 0.2 Henry respectively. The motor operates at 60 Hertz and 6 Ampere. Determine the maximum average developed torque. And there is one more note that since rotor does not have windings, thus no winding loss occurred in rotor, hence efficiency may be more than induction motor. Mm -hmm. uh, here are some advantages and disadvantages of reluctance motor. The advantages include that it has robust constru construction, less maintenance. DC supply is not required for rotor. The disadvantages are it has poor power factor, 